Right, let's take our Bibles if we could. We're going to turn to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to preach the second part of a sermon that I preached last week on Sunday afternoon. I, I'm sorry, Acts 13, not Acts 11, Acts 13. Now, Acts chapter 13. Verse number 44, the Bible says, In the next day, a Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Acts 13, 44. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, that they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken of by Paul, spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So imagine this picture. That's not true, contradiction. That's a lie that he's contradicting him. Blaspheming, saying things about God and attacking God and God's word and God's people. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God for, should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for, a, for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as, they, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout the, all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout men and honorable women, devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and came into unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, when people are lying about you, when people are attacking you, when people are uh, falsely accusing you and, and, and doing all kinds of raising persecution against you, notice they shook the dust off and they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We can have that joy in the Holy Spirit. Today, I want to talk again about being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach. May we be filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit, God, as we are in this world of darkness and you've given us the light, the truth, Lord, salvation, Lord, blessings and, uh, of being a Christian, all the blessings of being a Christian. So, Lord, help us to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we talked last week about the purpose for being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we went through several reasons. I'll give a quick recap of this. But the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, you know, he, get, he filled him with power. The purpose, one of the purposes for being filled with the Spirit is to be fill, filled with power. And God wants us to be filled with the power of God and have the power of God in our life. Now, they were actually doing miracles and signs and so forth. But I don't believe that, you know, that was for that time and period when there was no completed scripture. But today we can still be filled with power. And what does this come, how does this come out? Well, the, the next point I want to make, of course, is that it was for the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit was for boldness. In Acts chapter 4, the, uh, there was this time of persecution and they were commanded to be not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. They had this meeting in the, the, of all the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they said, you know what, we can't kill them, we can't hurt them, we can't, what, what can we do? And he said, we have to, they came to this conclusion that we're going to have to uh, fear them into submission, to scare them into submission, to, to try to uh, intimidate them and manipulate them through fear to stop them from preaching the gospel. So they threatened them. They issued threats against them. Uh, they were largely empty, but they weren't completely empty because they had been able to stir up a mob against Jesus and murder him and to, to kill him. <clears throat> but what was their response? The Bible says they prayed and were filled with the Holy Ghost and with boldness in Acts chapter 4. The Bible says in Acts 4, 28, for to, what, uh, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before the, to be done, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. The purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to, to have boldness. Another purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is for leading. Did you know that the Bible says uh, they were filled with the Holy of joy and with the Holy Spirit? But th think about this, as they're shaking the dust off their feet, just like Jesus had commanded them when they come into a city and they receive, are re not received to shake the dust off and go to the next city. Well, this idea in our vernacular would be basically saying, you know what, I wash my hands of it and just move on to the next place. Well, they did, and they went from place to place preaching the Word of God. God would lead them to the next place. Uh, Paul was pressed in the Spirit in Acts 18 to go and preach the gospel. Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. My friends, we... Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get these impressions like the Apostle Paul did. I believe it. What, was, what happened to him? The Bible says when he was pressed in the Spirit and testified uh, to the Jews that Jesus was Christ, and when they opposed themselves, and they, that they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. He says, I shake it off. I, I'm, you know, blood is on your own head. I've warned you. I've warned you. Just like Ezekiel, as the war, the uh, watchman on the wall talked, or as he talked about the watchman on the wall, they blasphemed, they opposed themselves, they were their own worst enemies. But God pressed him in the spirit and led him to go get preach. Now, I said last week, if God is leading you to do something spiritual, something good, it's probably not the, if you are being led to do that. If it pops in your head, go give that guy a track and tell him about Jesus. That's not the devil saying it. It's probably not your flesh saying it. It's probably the Holy Spirit. And so um, he felt like, man, I got to go tell these guys. And here's the thing. They didn't like it. But God wanted them to hear it anyway. And so that's the mercy of God as he wants the whole world to hear the gospel, give them lots of chances. But guess what? We still have free will, don't we? And so they can, they oppose themselves. They're their own worst enemies. Now, the next purpose, the one we haven't covered here, uh, is we got into it slightly, is the, the, the point that uh, being filled with the Spirit, the purpose of being filled with the Spirit is so that we can have that joy and the other fruits of the Spirit in our life. We said they were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. Well, they were taking up their cross and following Jesus. Some will heed the call for salvation. Many will not. Shake the dust off. Keep going with joy in your heart, filled with the Holy Ghost. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law. But let me also say this. There are many people who will take these fruits of the Spirit and turn them into a test of salvation. That's wicked. It's not a test of salvation. Oh, I don't see any fruit in your life. No love, joy, peace in your life. You must not be saved. No, you must not be filled with the Spirit. They'll say, well, the fruits are automatic. They come out in your life. No, they're not automatic. That's why he says in verse 24 of Galatians 5, And they which are, are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What is he saying? Don't walk in the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. You see, this passage tells us about two natures. Two natures. I, uh, the heavenly divine nature that, that is born into our life that's born of God, that doth not sin, that doesn't want to sin, but, that, but there's also that old man who's present with us. One man was preaching and he said, hey, you know what? Um, you've, got, you've got, you know, before you were saved, you were a pig. And you liked wallowing around in the muck and the sin and the mire. But when you get saved, it's like a kitty cat. Now you, you get a little mud on it and you're like <laughs> cleaning it off your paw. Like you never get in the mud anymore. We were talking about it just a minute ago. Brother Greg said, bad analogy. You know, guess what? 
that pig part of you still in there and wants to go roll around in the mud. Romans chapter 7, read it. I don't know about kitty cats. I would never use a kitty cat to, to, to show a, a saved person. But um, I don't know about those kitty cats. They're, they're a little devious, but I don't know. Anyway, I get the point, right? They're, they're more clean animals. Actually, I don't know. I heard there's some parasites on them that are really nasty for humans. Anyway, I'm just kidding, you cat lovers out there. I'm just, just picking on you. But look, that's, it's not all. I mean, look, you're still going to want to roll around in the mud. You're still going to want to sin. When I would do good, what is present with me? Evil is present with me. What did the Apostle Paul say? Come on. That's why he says in Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then it goes and gives the list of the lusts of the flesh. What? Fornication, uncleanness. I mean, what are all they all? Adultery, witchcraft, variance, wrath, strife, drunkenness, revelings. And then they'll read that part. Well, in the such like, I tell you, as I've told you at the times past over in 1 Corinthians, that they which uh, do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you know, see there, if you do those things, you're not saved. That's not what it's saying at all. He's saying that's not what Christians should do, Okay. As a matter of fact, once we're saved, we're forgiven of those things. And positionally in Christ, we're, our, our sin debt's washed away. If, if it's saying, you, it wouldn't make any sense to say that this is saying that you won't do these things at all if you're truly born again. It, because he commands you to walk in the Spirit. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he says, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And then he tells us at the end... Not this I say, walk in the Spirit. This, or, or, uh, sorry, at the end where he says, um, he tells them to, you know, walk in the Spirit. And you, uh, where, which one is it there? Let's see if I have it. But if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That led us is saying, look, guys, we need to do this thing. Come on, come on. And so they twist verses like this, and they say, if you do those sins, you're not saved. If you don't have the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you're not saved. That's a twisting of the Scriptures, isn't it? Because it's not saying that. It's saying to walk in the Spirit. It's a command. Be filled with the Spirit. That's a command of Scripture. We shouldn't go back into those sins. We should live like what Christ would have us to live. But the fact is, we don't. Often. His command is for us to walk in the Spirit. In John chapter 15, turn over there please. We have two natures that, that are warring against us in our body. And for, uh, for us to fulfill the work that God has, has for us, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because, see, w when we say if you're, not, if you're not going forward in your faith, you're going backwards, it's because if you're walking you know, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you're filled with the flesh. If you're not submitting to the Spirit, you're doing what you want to do. If you're not doing what God wants you to do, then you're doing what you want to do. And so guess what? If you walk in the flesh, you'll fulfill the lusts and the desires of the flesh. But if you walk in the Spirit, He'll begin to transform you and bring out the fruits of the Spirit in your life. In John 15, 17, it says, These things I command you, Jesus said, that you love one another. If the world hates you, no, no, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If they were of the world, the world would, not, would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Uh, verse 24. And if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. And this is co come to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in the, their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you 
from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of me, as ye also shall bear witness, because ye have, uh, have been with me from the beginning. Notice, you see here that we are given the Holy Spirit for truth and for testifying of Jesus Christ. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us we don't have to take it personally. Like when we go out soul winning and people slam the door in our face, it cuss us out, we've had it all happen. But when we're filled with the Spirit, it's not we don't take it personally. We understand that when somebody rejects us, it's because they are rejecting the Lord. The Holy Spirit will help us not to get bitter, reclusive, or withdrawn because the Holy Spirit will bear fruit in our life. Another fruit of the Spirit is, is uh, converts, right? Uh, uh, and boldness for the gospel. The Bible says the fruit of the, the, of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. You know, you'll, these guys will say, well, you're not saved if you don't bear the fruits of the Spirit, if you're walking in the flesh. But what about being a soul winner? They never bring that up. <laughs> Because, they, you know, they're not soul winners. They're soul losers. In John 15, 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that, he beareth, that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean uh, through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. He's a command now. If it's a command, it's not automatic. We have to do this. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into fire, the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. When we get born again, we, are, we have now an opportunity to bear fruit and earn rewards in heaven. What a beautiful passage. When we, when we walk in the Spirit, when we abide in Christ and His, uh, he, he, his power flows through us, we will bear fruit. We'll get our prayers answered, and we can actually bring forth much fruit. It's a beautiful thing. Now, if we don't abide in Christ, the Bible says we're cast forth as a branch and, and burned in the fire. This is not a reference to hell. This is an agricultural reference. When a tree, tree branch has no life in it, it falls to the ground or it's cut off. Uh, so that the life-giving uh, flow from the tree can go out and bear fruit in other branches. And uh, the, the, dead, the dead branches aren't doing any good for that tree, so they prune them off. And then what do they do? They mulch it. They make it into, uh, they burn it, whatever, and they, they use it to basically you know, go back to the ground and fertilize the ground uh, so the tree can grow even better. Paul said, you know, talked about the fact that he didn't want to become a castaway after he had preached to others. So he, what did he do? He said, I bear in my body. He said, I, uh, I, I, uh, I can't even quote it today. I'm sorry. But he says he, he takes, uh, he, he controls his, his appetites and his fleshly lusts so that he does not become a castaway. A castaway is basically like a reject or a reprobate. I, I'm not talking about a Christian losing their salvation, and I'm not talking here about a lost person becoming reprobate, vile, uh, becoming a reprobate, having a reprobate mind. I'm talking about a Christian dirtying their vessel, ruining and wrecking their life to the point where God can't use them, and then God just, you know, cutting them, you know, just, just symbolically saying, you know what, I'm setting you on the shelf. I'm not going to use you anymore. And that's a sad place to be. In John 15, verse 10, it says, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in me, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. God wants us to be joyful servants. There are several examples that we could give about being filled with the Spirit to end this sermon this afternoon. In the book of Acts, I think it would be a great place to, 
to, to look. Let's go to Acts 2. Acts 2. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, and they were, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Tongues was not, uh, this, it literally says other tongues. It doesn't say um, unknown tongues or whatever. This is not some sort of heavenly language. Uh, this is confusing, confusing for Pentecostals and all of that. But, but God's giving them other languages that they're able to speak. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, flip over to Acts chapter 4, verse 8. And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I'm sorry, start over. And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Jump down to verse 31. Filled with the Holy Ghost, preaching the gospel clearly. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither was any of them that ought of those things which possessed with his own. But they had all things common. Turn to Acts chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me give you uh, Barnabas. Uh, what it says about Barnabas in Acts 11, 24. He, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. A Holy Spirit filled Christian is someone that God can use. In Acts chapter 6, we have one of the great examples of a spirit-filled Christian in the Bible. Stephen was one of those outstanding characters of the early church. In Acts chapter 6, it says uh, that they had a problem. They were looking for uh, someone to uh, help with, um, basically, with the widows and the orphans, to minister to those that needed extra help in the church. The qualifications were given. In Acts 6, 3, it says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, uh, you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the saying, Please the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. My friends, God wants to use you. And I don't know in what way and, and what place, but you know what? If you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit with the time appointed, he'll use you. Stephen was one of those characters in the early church that we read about and we just, you know, just captivates our attention. You know, he didn't, he wasn't the one following Jesus as a disciple, but he's there in the midst of the early church there in Jerusalem. I mean, he's there. And the church, this very large congregation, uh, is there and they, the, they need, the, you know, the apostles say, look, find me a man filled with the Holy Ghost that has a good testimony, has an honest testimony, that's a good godly Christian. And they brought seven men in and Stephen was one of them. What a mighty preacher he was. But what was his secret? Was it because that he had taken speaking classes and knew how to speak to people? He knew how to tell stories. He was a great communicator. Was it that, you know, he was funny? Was it that he was uh, very winsome and a, a personable person? No, my friends. What made him special was that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to understand it is important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit fullness is not just for preachers. Oh, that's not for missionaries, evangelists, or whoever. In Acts 2.4, it says they, on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit. Every one of them. Like 120 of them up there. And they all went out preaching the gospel. You know, and, and here's the great thing. You know, it's not, it's not my job alone, right? It's all your jobs. You know, the teenagers, even the kids, they can share the gospel at whatever level they can. They can preach the gospel to people. Tell their friends. Tell their family. I mean, we got kids in here learning large sections of the Bible every month. 
memorizing them. Memorize that Romans road and tell other people about it. Give people the gospel. Obviously, we use more verses than just the typical Romans road, but you could, I mean, that would be a good start right there. Your parents will probably help you out or somebody else will help you out if you get stuck. Don't worry about that. But this man, this man, man, he, and I'm just saying, look, this is not, this is, this is for everybody. This is for everybody. It, it, it's, being filled with the Spirit is for kids too. It's for teenagers. It's for men, women, pastors. This isn't for rich people or poor people. This is for everybody. God has made this provision for all of us. I want you to think about this. I'll give you just a couple thoughts about Stephen and we'll be done. Stephen was a man available. That's a good thing. A spirit-filled Christian is somebody available to serve the Lord. I mean, he, they picked him and he said yes. Now, he wasn't given a prominent task. I mean, think about the job he was given. You know, I mean, this isn't the Sunday morning worship service. He's not the one up there leading it. He's not the worship leader, the band director, the choir director. He's not up there doing that. He's over there uh, with the, the, the widows and the orphans make, giving them meals, going around and helping the widows and orphans. That's a servant of the Lord, though. Stephen was ready. But man, you know, here he is. He's faithful to the Lord. He's a soul winner. He's serving, just serving people, taking up the task. You know, so you know what? I'll be that servant. I'll go and serve the widows. I'll serve the orphans. I'll go take that load off the pastor, uh, the, the pastors, you know, the apostles here. And he goes and does it, but he's still just faithfully preaching the gospel. And man, you know, I don't, I don't want to go out like Stephen did, but man, if I got to go out, I mean, that's about the best way to go. I mean, preaching, <laughs> preaching the gospel, you know? I just heard about Stephen Trowell. They got that, that you know, the man that was in my, in my dormitory uh, that, that got killed in Iraq. They, they brought the, those men that killed him to justice. And you know what? I mean, it's a tragedy, and I feel so bad for that, that man's wife and his five kids. But man, when, when there's that reunion in heaven and everything, and God comes down and puts a crown, a crown of life on his head, that's going to be pretty cool, you got to admit. Oh, man. Whew. All seven of these men were ready to do it. Preach the gospel. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. What does the Holy Ghost filling do? Gives you boldness. Gives you joy. Helps you to serve. Let me give you a couple more things about it, just real quick. In Acts 6, uh, it also says, in verse 8, that he did great wonders and miracles. Now, I believe that was for that time and that period when there was no Bible. But you know, if you're Holy Spirit filled, he's going to do great things through you. You're going to touch people's lives in ways that, that you have no idea. I'm just kind of giving you bullet points here now because I'm, I want to finish up with the time. But this was the Holy Spirit working through him. He was a, full of the Holy Ghost. This was not him, you know, delivering a great speech. This was not him doing, you know, just, you know, coming up with a great, you know, outline and all of this. It was the Holy Spirit working through him. And God touched people's lives. He changed people. He helped people. In Acts 6, 9, and, uh, and on through there, the Bible talks about how this, this uh, attack is on Stephen by these religious people, right? I mean, they're going, you know, they're disputing with him. Uh, you know, they, they've got false witnesses against him and all of this in, in chapter 6. And um, they have this plot to get rid of him. In Acts 6, the um, Bible says in verse number 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called uh, the, the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians. Let's go to verse uh, the, uh, the end of the verse. It says, Disputing with Stephen. And they're not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Notice that. You know, 
God will give us the words to speak if we're defending him and standing for him. Then they suborned him and said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. That's, that was, that's ridiculous. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. And we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which the Moses delivered to us, which he did. Jesus rent the, the veil in half. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Man, I love this story. <laughs> I mean, here he is. And so here is, here is the, the, a third thing that the Holy Spirit uh, can do for us when it comes to this, in this example of Stephen is that it actually helps us to be gracious when we're being attacked. Have you ever been lied about? Have you ever been provoked and attacked? I mean, people are just ripping you to shreds. And your flesh is just like, let them have it. I want to go both fists, double barrel. I want to go fight with them. You know, tit for tat. You know. Numb skull, bonehead. <laughs> Jerk. You know. Back at you. But how did he re react under his, this, this, this provocation, this attack, this, this, this angry, vehement attack? I mean, I would sympathize with him. And he lashed out, retaliated, smarted off, attacked him with such pressure. But he reacted graciously. He was provoked and, and pressed to the limit. And what a, what a testimony it is when Christians have that love, joy, and peace in their heart. The greatest of these is charity, right? And so that's, that's a powerful, powerful message to send you know, that, that, that we find here. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. You know, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but in Acts 7, he preaches an awesome sermon, right? And to put yourself in context, this is to a crowd that just killed Jesus not too awful long ago. These people hate him. Like, they're trying to get kill him. I mean, they do not like him. They, they do, I mean, it's a very clear, they're trying to lie about him. They're trying to put him to death over here for blaspheming and all of this kind of stuff. And yet he's still, after all of that, he gets up and he's like, you killed the Lord Jesus. He tried to tell, you took up the star of your God, Molech, you know, Rem Rem Pham in the desert. Uh, you, I mean, he's just like ripping them apart. You're worshipers to the devil. I mean, on and on and on. And, and he's preaching in the Spirit now. He's preaching the Word of God. But I want you to think about this. You know, a Spirit-filled Christian is mighty in the Scriptures. Because what, what was Jesus' promise? He said, don't premeditate on what to say. He said, I will tell you what to say. And Stephen is just like throwing out these Old Testament. Uh, uh, I wish, you just go home and read it later. In Acts 6, or Acts 7. But man, he is just like coming out with the scriptures. Boom, boom, boom. Before his accusers. I mean, I like to call it a sermon, but he's, you know, this is his response. He knew the scriptures. Praise God. The Holy Spirit was bringing them to his mind. We, we talked about that earlier, how the Holy Spirit will guide us and bring those scriptures to our mind so that we can have peace in the midst of these situations. He believed the scriptures. It was, it was confirmed in his heart. He didn't waver in the face of attackers and death. He refers to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. He refers to the patriarchs. He refers to Joseph. He, he goes through Moses, and, and he talks about the, the Red Sea and how they were delivered through the Red Sea. He believed the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit confirms the Scriptures in our heart. He preached the Scriptures. He preached the scriptures. I mean, how skillfully did he use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? That's what preaching is. Preaching is not just getting, a, a, you know, a slick outline, two, three points, a poem, and a funny story, and, you know, trying to make everybody laugh. It's preaching the Word with the Spirit of God. 
He presented Christ in the scriptures. He showed how he, he spoke, you know, uh, of Jesus and how he came to this earth. He's talked about how Jesus is perfect. He was sinless. He was a preacher of the gospel. And he applied. I mean, look at Acts 7, verse 51. He didn't just preach the word, but he applied it to the listeners. I mean, he showed them where they were wrong. Real, I mean, a lot of the pr problem with a lot of this preaching to, out there today is it, it is not really applicable. They're, they're not preaching against sin. They're not preaching against you know, problems. They're not, they're not helping people with their common sins. He says this to them, verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we go out soul winning all the time. And, you know, we're not trying to be mean. We're just trying to find out the truth. And people will, you know, tell us, oh, yeah, I'm saved. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, I went to a Baptist church. I'm saved. Okay. We had a guy literally tell us this the other day. I, I, said, um, I said, he said, I go to Free Will Baptist Church. Okay. Well, um, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Yes. I said, okay. What do you believe you have to do to go to heaven? Well, you have to keep the Old Testament commandments. Now, I'm telling you, I'm not being, I'm not prideful about this, but you know it's true. There's a lot of soul winners out there who would have just been like, well, praise the Lord, brother, you're a Baptist. And again, I'm nothing, okay? I'm just saying I've seen this. That's why you got to press this a little bit. You know, what, you know, what do you believe you have to do to go to heaven? You got to ask those questions to get to the heart of the matter. We gotta apply it to their life. Keep the commandments. I said, I don't think that's what your church teaches. <laughs> you know. Um, then he, he goes on, I mean, which of the prophets have you have you not your fathers persecuted? I mean, he's ripping them apart. He's like, You killed Jesus, you killed the prophets. Anyway, he applied the spirit his message to the listeners. I mean, he, he, you know, that's, that's the thing about confrontational soul winning. You know, we actually try to figure out where people are wrong on their, on their gospel, what they're trusting in. And then, and this is not us. It was not original with us. I mean, you know, we're, thank God for the, the apostles. Thank God for Stephen. Thank God for John Rice and, you know, Curtis Hudson, these guys that, you know, and other soul winners, right? Many soul winners, not just, it's not us, but, you know, you, you've got to, like, apply it. You've got to point out where the problems are. Apply it. A spirit-filled Christian is one who's full of the Word of God. Full of the Word of God. Why is that? Because the Spirit wrote the Word of God. He inspired it. He, he gave it to man, and He teaches us. He guides us in all truth. And I'll say this as well as I get near the end here. The Spirit-filled Christian is sustained through the hour of tribulation. Stephen, look down at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus sustain, standing on the right hand of God and saying, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran up a, a, upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him and the, and the, uh, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Oh, my friends. They went and killed him. They killed him. What was his reaction in the midst of this, of this attack? I mean, they stoned him to death. Did he cry out with, with self-pity? Did he cry out to the accusers? Oh, no, don't do this. Oh. No. He steadfastly looked up to heaven. I mean, the Lord helped him through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
That's what the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit will do. He rode through the storm triumphantly. He went through the tribulation triumphantly. Bible says in verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. What does a spirit-filled man do when death faces him? Well, he can look steadfastly to heaven and say, hey, hey, there, God's waiting for me there. Heaven's a home is a, prepared, a place for me. I love the fact that when a Holy Spirit, no, let me just point this out too I'm thinking, as I'm thinking about it. Um, let me look down here, see um, which verse it is. Verse 59, yeah. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeling down cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said, lay, and said this, he fell asleep. You see, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is trying to conform us into the image of Christ. But this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, the beautiful thing here is that Stephen, as he was filled with the Holy Spirit, became like Christ. I'm not talking about his deity or anything like that, but in his actions, he, he followed. I mean, this is literally, as they saw Jesus die on the cross, as, they were, as, he, as he knew about this event that took place, he had heard about these seven th sayings, probably, of Christ on the cross. And when it came to his time, they're, they're picking up stones. He kneels down. And just like Jesus, he commends his spirit to God. Into thy hand I commend my spirit. What a, what a powerful thing to say. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, whether it's at the hand of some angry mob, or if it's, if it's just at the hand of cancer. If you're filled with the spirit... There's this release there. There's this like, Lord, you got me. If this is where I go, into thy hand. I give you my spirit. Take it. It's yours. Jesus said the same thing on the cross. And then in this heart of love of the people who was, who was even killing him, just like Jesus, just like Jesus said, he says, Forgive them. Now, Stephen could never experience what Jesus went through on the cross because Jesus, you see, he bore the sins of the whole world on him on the cross. So Stephen was not, you know, doing that at all. But he was dying for our Lord as a martyr. And he received, he's going to receive the martyr's crown. That's what a spirit-filled Christian is like. The Holy Spirit will, will make us, if we allow Him, as we fill, are filled with the Spirit, and we'll, we'll do things that, the, that, that Jesus would, want, would do. We would do things the way Jesus would want them done. Look at it, Acts 8, 2. Or 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto death, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church at, that was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them, or committed, committed them to prison. Stephen... It's filled with the Spirit. And you know, Spirit-filled people will be lamented. There'll be, there'll be people mourning and weeping over Spirit-filled men of God and women of God. At the burial of Stephen, people came out and there was a great lamentation over him. What a loss it was to the church when Stephen had to go to heaven. I mean, we felt like, I mean, they all felt like, man, a great hero of the faith just went. A great man filled with the Holy Spirit. 
But what an inspiration that he was to all those that were in that church. I mean, notice what happens in the book of Acts. Saul, he goes to war. I mean, he's like, man, I'm going to war with Christians now. This emboldened the devil's crowd. But it also emboldened God's people. And they went out and preached. They were started multiplying at this point. And many were saved. And then God went and got Paul saved and turned the tables. So remember, with God, all things are possible. Praise God. You know, if we're spirit-filled, we live for Him. The consequences are in His hands. The outcome is in His hands. All of that's in His hands. Duty's in the hand of man. The outcome is in the hand of God. Stephen was a man full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. I think he's a great example to end on. We need to try to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. We need to walk in the Spirit, and we will not, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these great examples that you've given us from the Word of God so that we could try to be filled with the Spirit ourselves. God, we, we need your help. We need that filling. But, you know, it requires us to be emptied, Lord, of our own fleshly desires, to, to walk in the Spirit, not walk in the flesh. And so, God, I pray that you would just help us to overcome these, these uh, foolish, hurtful lusts, Lord, that ensnare us and enslave us, God, in sin. And Lord, to yield to your Holy Spirit so that, that we could be like a Stephen, so that we could be like these other great spirit-filled Christians throughout the Bible and throughout history. We love you. Please bless us. Thank you for that filling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.